and welcome to this session of Leto Lectures as we examine what occurred before, during, and after the events of November the 3rd in a lecture entitled America Votes. Wasn't that a nail biter? Wasn't that every bit as exciting as perhaps we might have thought it would have been beforehand? The voting taking place November the 3rd, followed by the counting of ballots cast not only on the 3rd, some cast before, some coming in later via the mails, that carried us into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and finally on Saturday following the election, when a preponderance, a majority of the media, relying on what might be considered to be the less reliable statistical analyses that took place, called enough states in favor of the Democrat Joe Biden to put him over the magic 270 electoral vote mark and confer upon him from early Saturday morning onward the new title of President-Elect of the United States. And boy, if you like this stuff, when did you find time to sleep? Um, how tired were you becoming of people like Wolf Blitzer and Brett Blair, Bear and Rachel Maddow until she contracted coronavirus and had to begin um, self-secluding? Um, Lawrence O'Donnell, Carl Rove, Anderson Cooper, all of the analysts telling us minute by minute, hour by hour, slowly how the votes were coming in in those states that would ultimately decide um, the winner of the race. When do you ever encounter a circumstance when a secretary of state, of a state like Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or Michigan, how about local supervisors of elections in Philadelphia County, um, in Delaware County, um, in other counties, in these battleground states would become quasi-celebrities. Only in 2020 and only regarding this election, which brought uh, together, of course, not only the oldest two candidates to ever seek the office of President of the United States, President Donald Trump, the 74-year-old um, incumbent, and Vice President Joe Biden, former Vice President Joe Biden, his 77-year-old um, opponent. Um, when have we ever had to vote at a time when doing so might actually require some risk, um, given the fact that on November the 3rd, we were still not only in the grips of the pandemic, the coronavirus, um, COVID-19, but we were in a period where on that day, every state was showing increases in the number of cases um, that were being um, reported. I think in a great testament to American democracy, in a great testament of showing how Americans were interested in the outcome of this race and other lower down ballot races that were taking place, we are approaching near record turnout numbers as votes are still being counted slowly but surely and lower ballot races are still being decided in states like California, Ohio, New York, Cases or states where we know the winner of the presidential race, thus taking it out of the public spotlight, but states where there are still millions of votes um, remaining to be counted. So by comparison, the presidential election of 1960, 
the torch passed to a new generation of leaders. John F. Kennedy um, versus Richard Nixon drew a modern record 63.8% of the electorate to turn out and vote. As we stand here today, about a week after um, the election, more than 62% of eligible American voters, meaning more than 145 million Americans, in one form or another, cast a vote in these elections in what could very well be, when all is said and done, the highest turnout in an American presidential election in more than 100 years. I know that probably a few of you participated in both the presidential election of 1960 and then again in the election of 2020. So I want to congratulate you in having taken play a part in both of these truly um, um, enormous turnouts by American standards um, to elect our president. Now, on election night, we saw, of course, in retrospect, what we've suggested would occur in, in our previous lecture, and that is the differences in how states dealt with the um, means of voting, and in particular, states that permitted mail-in voting or very generous early voting or absentee voting to take place. Now, by 11 o'clock Eastern Time, by midnight Eastern Time, we saw in states like Florida and Ohio and Texas um, the preponderance, the overwhelming majority of the votes counted so that calls were able to be made in Florida, in Texas, in Ohio, in those three states, in fact, declaring uh, President Donald Trump to have won those states. However, as Tuesday bled into Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, we saw other of the so-called battleground states, the purple states, states like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, and two apparently fairly new battleground states, Georgia and Arizona, along with Nevada, um, slowly crawl to count the votes in order to eventually, in, in all but two cases, Georgia and Arizona, be able to um, have a winner of those states projected. The reason being, quite simply, is that in states like Florida, like Texas, um, like Ohio, where early voting and mail-in vo voting have been the norm for a very long time, these states permitted mail-in votes to be counted almost as soon as they were received by various supervisors of, of elections throughout these states. So when the polls closed and when the first results were produced, almost immediately the results of the mail-in voting um, the absentee voting and the early voting were displayed showing in most cases Joe Biden to have surged ahead. We recognized in our last lecture um, something that the polls got right, that Democrats were overwhelmingly more likely to opt for early voting opportunities um, for mail-in voting and, and voting at a precinct early, while Republicans preferred by a majority to wait and go cast their votes the old-fashioned way on Election Day at the polls. So in states that had pre-counted all of their early vote, we saw Biden surge ahead in Florida, 
in Ohio, for a time, even in Texas, but within a few hours, as the same day votes began to pour in, we saw President Trump overtake Biden. And as the same day vote is more rapidly counted, county by county by county and reported, President Trump had been comfortably declared the winner in those states. Now, on the other hand, in part due to the fact that at least since April, when it became clear that the pandemic probably was not going to go away by Easter, or maybe even by the end of the summer. And as states began to prepare, in many cases to utilize mail-in voting, which their laws permitted, but which counties in many states seldom used, to a much more expansive degree. The idea that in some states, perhaps 50% of the electorate would choose to vote by mail, by absentee ballot, some voting early. President Trump began to criticize mail-in voting, and in particular, the easily received ballots mailed to every registered voter in some states as a prescription for fraud, as a prescription for stealing an election, as a very insecure way for a state to administer a presidential election for its citizens. And, and we heard the drumbeat um, in rallies, on Twitter, day after day after day, really all the way up to the cusp of the election. So early this year, when officials responsible for running these elections, secretaries of state and local county election supervisors, requested in states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan that their legislatures permit them to do, like other states, that is to count and tabulate mail-in and absentee votes as they arrived well before election day, all three of these states Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, states that, maybe it's a coincidence, have Republican-controlled legislatures refuse to do so. The mandate in those three states was that mail-in ballots and absentee ballots could only begin to be counted on election day itself. So what transpired in those three states in particular was sort of the reverse of what we saw take place in states like um, Florida and Texas. When the first um, votes began to come in and be reported following the close of the polls, those were of those voters who had voted on election day, maybe some early live votes produced as well. So given the fact that Republican voters were more likely to turn out on election day, we saw throughout election night and early into um, Wednesday morning, President Trump run up huge leads in these states at one point, leading in Pennsylvania by more than 600,000 votes, because in Wisconsin and in Michigan and in Pennsylvania, the early votes that were released were of those who had voted in person on election day. And that created in 
Wisconsin and in Michigan and in Pennsylvania, what came to be known as the Red Mirage for a number of hours through election night and spilling into the next day, Wednesday, and in some cases, even Thursday. President Trump led in all of these states until the millions of mail-in and absentee votes were processed, counted, their totals released, and in each of these three states, by Saturday morning, the tables had been turned and Joe Biden narrowly, we're going to go over the numbers in a while, but very eerily, almost as narrowly as President Trump had won Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania four years ago, it turns out that Joe Biden instead had won them all. The blue wall of these three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and uh, Pennsylvania metaphorically, has been reconstructed, and in fact, Pennsylvania was the state that ultimately pushed Joe Biden over the um, 270 um, electoral vote um, mark. Um, in the run-up to Election Day, uh, the high reliance on mail-in votes, the United States Postal Service had suddenly become politicized allegations exchanged of attempts to slow down the mail, slow down sorting systems, in essence, maybe slowing down when um, late mailed um, ballots might actually be received by, by election officials. In addition, several states like Pennsylvania determined that they were going to count every mail-in ballot that was not received by Election Day, November the 3rd, but postmarked instead by Election Day, November the 3rd. So in the days that followed, as these ballots began to come in and be counted, they again would contribute to mainly um, Joe Biden's lead in, in that case. Um, more about that. Um, later, maybe even um, a lot more about that later. But again, in, in retrospect, these confusing types of circumstances, Biden shooting to a lead in states that pre-counted mail-in votes, only to see his lead decline when the same day voting was calculated and reported. And then the flip side, in states that first reported the same day voting, the November the 3rd voting, President Trump shot to the lead only to see his lead decline and eventually he be overtaken by Biden as the mail-in and absentee votes um, began to be um, counted. So as we stand here today, um, Joe Biden has secured um, enough electoral votes to again become the um, president-elect of the United States. What his final vote total may be is yet undetermined, um, as low as 279, uh, maybe as high as, as 306. Keeping in mind, of course, that President Trump has not yet conceded this race, and in fact, up until today at least, has asserted that he is going to very vigorously in a number of states go to court, alleging again voting irregularities, um, illegalities, and in essence attempts to systematically steal this election from him. Lots of allegations that have been made on the internet, um, all over cable TV. The president has one of the most powerful um, communication platforms in the United States on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, Saturday afternoon, held a 
press conference outside of the Four Seasons Lawn and Garden Service in, in Philadelphia, again, reciting a litany of allegations, but the Trump campaign has not yet produced any proof to suggest the type of irregularity, the type of rigging, the type of multi-state fixing of races that suggests some plausible way to nullify and negate the results of, of the voting. We've never seen in our history um, irregularities of the type um, suggested in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, um, in Georgia that we may um, have heard or may be hearing about in, in the days um, to come. Now, again, because of the undecided state at this part of Georgia and, and of Arizona, two states that have long been reliably red Republican voting state, you know, Georgia here in, in 2020 is, is surrounded by red, even though at this point, prior to a recount that will take place in Georgia, um, Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden, President-elect Biden, all these titles, has about a 10,000 vote lead. In Arizona, the home state of Barry Goldwater, long considered to be one of the most reliably um, conservative voting, Republican voting states in, in the country. Um, Vice President Biden, as we stand here today, has about a 19,000 vote lead over President Trump, a number that has been dwindling as more and more votes come in from a more politically balanced and a more politically and ethnically diverse state like Arizona, two states that still need to, to be called. Now, we recognize that Article 2 of the United States Constitution created the system that Americans still use today to select our president. Um, doomed, I think, forever to confusion in part by the name it was given, the Electoral College, we are, of course, in the midst of watching a system for electing the American president um, play out. We know, of course, that every state before Election Day has a defined number of electoral votes that are available to be won by either candidate or any of the candidates, I guess, seeking the presidency. We know um, that the more populous the state is, the more electoral votes that it will have um, speak in help determining the American president. You add together the number of seats a state has in the House of Representatives, which is based on population, and can change every 10 years following the census. Some states could gain seats in the House, others can lose seats in the House. And you add to that number, the number of seats in the House, two for the number of senators that every state, irrespective of population, has been given. So we have 435 seats in total in the House of Representatives arrayed over 50 states. We have 100 senators that takes us to 535. And then when states amended the Constitution in 1961 to give the District of Columbia votes in electing the president, D.C. was given the same number of electoral votes as the least populous states in the country receive. That number is three. Each of these states, Montana, the Dakotas, Wyoming, um, Alaska, have only one member 
in the House that represents the entire state, but like every state, they have two senators, so they have three electoral votes. <clears throat> you add them up, and the total number of electoral votes up for grabs is 538. Article 2 of the Constitution says that in order to be elected president, a candidate has to win a majority of whatever the total number might be, meaning, of course, the magic number 270, the barest majority of 538. Now, keep in mind that once this election is done, this map will be obsolete because the census that was conducted this year is probably going to show when the results are released early next year that some states like Florida, like Texas, like Arizona, like probably Georgia and North Carolina and Wyoming are going to gain population enough to give them additional seats in the House. And because the number of seats in the House is fixed, at 435, we know that if Texas gets what's projected to be three more House seats, Florida projected to get two, maybe even three itself, and these others, largely Sunbelt states, states that lots of people are moving to from other parts of the country, receive one each, they have to come those seats from somewhere. And that is probably going to come from states that we're going to see continue to lose seats in the House. Places like New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan and Illinois and, and maybe Wisconsin and for the very first time, California are projected to lose House seats. So when we're standing here, hopefully live and in person once again, four years from now to go through that year's road to the White House, um, we will be looking at certain states having different numbers of electoral votes. And again, a compromise at the Constitutional Convention to satisfy the demands of more populous states for greater representation but at the same time to recognize the potential sovereignty of each individual state as part of a federation of states of a federal system to give them, again, uh, two seats in the Senate irresponsive, irrespective of, of population. Now, the Constitution further greatly decentralizes the power to conduct and run elections to state officials, many secretaries of individual states, secretaries of state, are ultimately responsible for running elections within their own state. But we know that a lot of their duties are actually delegated to local county election supervisors, and in some cases, even to sub-county precinct overseers of the election process. So we know that every state has a great amount of autonomy to establish how its election is going to be run. Um, is there going to be early voting? Is a state by state by state um, determination. Are absentee votes going to be um, given very liberally to anyone for who asks for one, or do you actually have to show you're going to be outside of the state and able to in, in order to be able to to cast one of these? We know, of course, that mail-in voting has become more popular in in many states, um, states like Florida and Arizona and Texas, for instance, with populations that are growing and in some cases, populations that are, are getting older um, have created, again, these early mail voting uh, possibilities, while other states have been very stingy 
and in some cases do not permit mail-in voting at all, while in other cases, a state like Oregon conducts all of its voting entirely by mail. Every registered voter is sent a ballot, turn it in, don't turn it in, it's up to you, but the vote is conducted largely through the use of mail-in ballots. Not only that, the Constitution gives to every state the ability to determine how its electoral votes are going to be won. Um, very, very early in, in our country's history, um, in the early 1800s, um, many state legislatures created panels who selected the individuals who would be the electors, representing, again, one of the electoral votes that each of the states had been um, awarded. Beginning in 1836, and really accelerating in the decades that followed, every state utilized the popular vote between candidates in that state. Whoever won the most votes in a state would win, in most cases, all of that state's predetermined number of electoral votes, meaning that how a state votes on election day translates very directly into which candidate wins that state's electoral votes. Now, a state legislature, if it wanted to, could vote to give the state's electoral votes to the candidate who wins a coin flip. Whoever wins a coin flip gets all that state's electoral votes. A state could, if it chooses, and a number of states are entertaining um, uh, a process whereby states would award their electoral votes to the candidate who wins the national popular vote. The Electoral College as an electoral system can only be changed by amending the Constitution, which is an excruciatingly difficult, these days, impossible process to achieve. But if enough states whose electoral votes total 270 or more agree to amend their election laws, to give their electoral votes to the candidate who wins the nationwide popular vote, there is not overtly any law or any Supreme Court decision that will prevent them from so doing. Now, as it turns out, in modern times and within the last 15 or 20 years, we've seen electoral votes awarded in, in one of two ways. Um, all but the states of Nebraska and Maine award their electoral votes on a winner-take-all basis. So we've seen that whoever wins the most votes in a state, Joe Biden right now in Pennsylvania by um, 44,000 votes, um, Joe Biden leading right now in Georgia by 10,000 votes. Um, President Trump, four years ago, won Michigan by about 10,000 votes. Whoever wins the most votes, not a majority necessarily, but more than any other candidate in the race, wins all of that state's electoral votes. Winner take all. If you want Florida's 29 electoral votes, you've got to spend a lot of money advertising. You've got to spend a lot of money uh, politicking. You've got to send surrogates out because we don't split this number. You've got to come and earn all of it. 
Now, Maine and Nebraska's legislature have chosen to do something different. Um, recognizing that Maine has four electoral votes, Nebraska five, these two states split the way in which electoral votes can be won because two of Maine and Nebraska's electoral votes come on account of their having each two senators. The candidate who wins the statewide vote in Nebraska and in Maine win two of each of these states' electoral votes. The remaining electoral votes are determined by the candidate who wins the um, popular vote in each of Maine's two congressional district, Maine one and Maine two, and each of Nebraska's three congressional districts, Nebraska one, Nebraska two, Nebraska three. So not only is it possible only in Maine and Nebraska for a state's electoral vote totals to be split, that is exactly what has occurred in 2020. Um, Joe Biden won the statewide vote in Maine. He won the vote in Maine's first congressional district to the South, but President Trump has won or probably has won uh, Maine's congressional district to the North. So when Maine reports its electoral vote, it will be three for Biden, one for Trump. In Nebraska, President Trump easily won Nebraska's statewide vote. He easily won the vote in uh, Nebraska's first and third congressional district. But in Nebraska's second congressional district, a district that um, includes most of Omaha, Nebraska's most populous city, Joe Biden has won there. So when Nebraska reports its electoral vote totals, it will be split four for President Trump, one for former Vice President Biden. Those are the only two states where that can um, occur. Now, as we've been talking about over um, the last few lectures, in the days leading up to the election, it became clear that a number of states were going to vote very predictably, meaning that because of habit, because of their demographics, uh, because of the part of the country that they're located in, we could put comfortably almost 40 states either into the red column, the Republican column, in this case, the Trump column, and in the blue column, the Democratic column, this year, of course, um, the Biden column. What we've talked about over the last few lectures is what was going to happen in the swing states, the purple states, the battleground states. And we, in the last few lectures, have relied on polling, and in particular, those sites that aggregate and average the polls to give us some insight as to who might be winning in swing states and which states might be on the verge of becoming swing states, losing either a blue or, or a red identity. And, and we're going to see that for the second consecutive election cycle, polling in general um, let us down. It certainly did not report with great statistical accuracy the anticipated results in a number of states, 
largely because both in 2016 and in, in 2020, while the polls predicted that Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden were going to win the national popular vote, Biden may end up winning the national popular vote by five million votes when all are counted. The polls consistently undercalculated the number of votes that President Trump um, will eventually end up winning. Right now, um, Joe Biden has won about 75 million votes. The most ever won by a candidate seeking the presidency. While President Trump has won about 71 million votes, a number much higher than polling numbers nationally would have projected. And in fact, President Trump's um, 71 million votes are the most votes ever won by a sitting president seeking re-election. So the states that mattered um, are states that we've, we've talked about before. And when all of the dust has settled, we've seen that the aforementioned um, industrial states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania did indeed all flip for Vice President Biden. We remember that until 2016, when President Trump tore down this blue wall and began building you know, another wall down here, um, no Republican had won any of those three states since 1988, 28 years before. So Joe Biden did in fact narrowly win um, um, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Um, former Vice President Biden also won New Hampshire, the only state in the Northeast that at times has gone Republican, went this time for Joe Biden. Um, he narrowly won, but nonetheless has been projected as the winner in, in Nevada, um, a swing state, and confirmed that Colorado, once upon a time, one of the country's great swing states, is now a much more reliably um, blue state. President Trump, on the other hand, won the biggest prize, the largest swing state on the map, Florida, by more than three percentage points, a much larger margin of victory um, than, than was expected, and won very comfortably, much more comfortably than the polls would have led us to believe, in Ohio and Iowa. States, again, that once upon a time were two of the most swingiest of swing states, two of the most purple states, President Trump has won these two states very comfortably in two consecutive elections. Maybe Ohio and Iowa are now turning more red and again, less swingy, less purple. Um, in fact, Ohio, the great bellwether state, since 1964, everyone who has won the presidency of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, um, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bush the Elder, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, four years ago, Donald Trump won Ohio. This year, if the results stay as they are now, will mark the first time since 1964 where Ohio did not vote for the um, eventual winner. Um, President Trump kept Texas 
red projections of Texas turning, Texas turning blue. We'll hear them again four years from now, maybe even in the midterms two years from now, but that did not occur, of course, um, this time around. And of course, we know that President Trump won again Maine's second congressional district. That is a swingy district. And we know that Vice President Biden won um, Nebraska's second district, another swingy type of district. Still to be determined, however, are the outcomes in both Georgia and in Arizona. When all the votes are finally counted in Georgia, and I understand that the last of the provisional ballots are being counted, Vice President Biden will have about a 10,000 um, vote lead in Georgia. Experts, I use that word very guardedly, say that recounts, if anything, might flip a few hundred votes one way or another. So turning 10,000 votes in Georgia from Biden votes to Trump votes, 6,000 from Biden votes to Trump votes, according to experts, um, uh, may be hard to accomplish. Georgia might be more of a swing state in elections to come. Arizona, on the other hand, still has about 70,000 outstanding votes as we stand here today. Um, what's important to remember is that for the last four or five days, as Arizona has reported more and more and more of its votes, particularly from Maricopa County, uh, by far um, the largest population center in Arizona, Vice President Biden's, former Vice President Biden's lead has shrunk. President Trump closing the gap. This morning when I checked, um, Joe Biden led President Trump by just 19,000 votes in Arizona. Arizona may vote for Biden. It may um, retain its red status, but certainly going forward, I think Arizona and, and um, Georgia are swingy types of states, more diverse population, more college um, graduates, and larger urban centers, um, phenomena that tend to um, do well for Democrats. Now, we haven't talked yet about North Carolina. You know, North Carolina is, is a great retirement destination. You could live in the ocean, you could live in the mountains, you could play golf, you could enjoy um, these dynamic cosmopolitan cities like Charlotte and, and Durham and Raleigh, and of course, relax. And, and in keeping with this very relaxed, laid back attitude, North Carolina officially has not yet been called because they're not going to release their vote totals until November the 12th, nine days after election day, when all of the various early votes and mail-in votes and military votes are due, North Carolina will let us in on their secret who won the state. I've put it in the Trump column because North Carolina right now is a state where President Trump has a 70,000 vote lead, one that is seemingly insurmountable given the projections of how many outstanding votes need um, to be counted there. But again, North Carolina is, is one of these southern states. Lots of people moving into North Carolina from other parts of the country. Lots of college graduates, lots of well-paying jobs in, in their urban environments. It's making North Carolina a swingy type of state as, as well. So how badly did, did the pollsters screw up for the second time in a row and, and why? How can you know, anyone call themselves a statistician, a mathematician? You know, the exactitude of math, the beauty of math, nonetheless creating some um, very poor projections, even when you average all the polls, 
regarding the outcomes in, in these important states. In Florida, for instance, the final polls showed Joe Biden leading by 0.9 percentage points, less than one percentage point. But yet when the votes came in, President Trump won Florida by 3.4 percent about a four and a half point swing from the average of polls to the actual result. Uh, President Trump winning Florida um, by a greater margin in 2020 than he did four years ago. We know, of course, and we'll talk about some of the demographic reasons why um, in a bit. In Georgia, the pollsters had President Trump ahead by 1% of the vote, as we stand here today, Vice President Biden leads by 0.2% of the vote. In Ohio and in Iowa, the average of the polls had President Trump with a very narrow lead. One point in Ohio, two points in Iowa. He ended up winning both of those states, Ohio and Iowa, by more than eight percent of the vote, a huge under um, prediction. Now in the three, again, blue wall states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, the pollsters told us that Biden was going to win by an average of 6.7 percent. He ended up winning, he ended up winning instead by 0.7 percent six points off, his margin of victory, 20,000 votes or so in Wisconsin, approximately equal to President Trump's 23,000 um, vote margin of victory in Wisconsin in 2016. In Michigan, the average of the polls told us Joe Biden was going to win by 4.2% of the votes. He ended up winning instead by 2.6% percent of the vote. His margin of victory, about 150,000 votes, compared to President Trump's very narrow 10,000 vote margin of victory in Michigan in 2016. Remember, winner take all, the result in both cases. Finally, in Pennsylvania, the average of the polls um, had Vice President Biden, former Vice President Biden, with a 1.2% lead in, in the Keystone State, when the votes were reported, and they're still being counted now, former Vice President Biden leads by 0.7%. Um, About 43,000 votes separate him from President Trump four years ago President Trump won Pennsylvania by almost the same amount, 44,292. So this small shift, again, delivers these 20 electoral votes. Nationally, the polls reflected a belief that Joe Biden was 7.2% ahead in the national vote in the national popular vote, 51.2% to 44%. Right now, Biden's lead nationally over President Trump in the national popular vote is about 3.1%. Biden having won a majority of all votes cast, about 50.7%, President Trump winning 47%. 0.6%. The average of polls had President Trump only at 44%. So he did three and a half points better nationally than the polls suggested. And of course, it suggests that President Trump may end up being a transformational president. His candidacy may end up being a transformational candidacy. And we might be in the midst of what political scientists refer to as a political realignment, where large demographic sections of the population, 
and regions of a country that had rather reliably voted for the candidate of one party begin to gravitate over to the ranks of the other party. Our country's last great political realignment was the Reagan Revolution, which changed the voting habits of many devout, very religious American voters. They found a home in the Republican Party. And many blue collar workers, people that made their livings, you know, with their hands and their backs, once the unionized backbone of the Democratic Party began to gravitate over to the ranks of the Republican Party, the so-called phenomenon of the Reagan Democrat came along. Four years ago, President Trump came to the fore, winning the Republican nomination, and then of course explaining to uh, a large segment of the United States, certainly people in the old industrial manufacturing United States, now sometimes referred to as the Rust Belt, as manufacturing has fled to cheaper venues all around the world, President Trump came along, told these disaffected citizens he recognized their plight, and maybe it was lip service, but certainly many didn't consider it to be lip service. He was going to do something to return well-paying manufacturing jobs to, to the United States. So Trumpism was built on, on what politically we call a lot of isms. Um, it was built on, on a populist uh, platform, populism, the idea of drawing grassroots voters who might have been politically disconnected for a very long time to come to a candidate because of his magnetism, because of his message, because of the uh, specter of, of what that candidate was doing. We've seen President Trump engage in protectionism, pulling out of the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, renegotiating NAFTA, using tariffs against trading adversaries like China in a way we've never seen and in a way Republicans have never favored protectionist tactics. We've seen President Trump become a more isolationist president, isolationism, um, pulling out of the Paris um, Climate Accords, you know, pushing our allies around the world to pay more of the cost of defending them, trying to make peaceful inroads with Russia and, and North Korea, and again, bringing about more of an isolationism than the United States has engaged in since the end of the Second World War. Nationalism, make America great again. We are proud. We are Americans beating the chest of, again, being citizens of the greatest nation to have ever existed on earth. And then finally, and this is not necessarily a, a derisive term, President Trump engaged in nativist arguments, nativism being a belief that citizens of a country have a right to actively keep out of it people seeking to come and thrive and work and sponge, you know, illegally in our country to turn back refugees, people in parts of the world that they may be in danger and may need a refuge. There's other countries that will take refugees. Um, President Trump has dramatically reduced our consideration of refugee status and more recently, even attempting to reduce overall the number of legal immigrants we as a country were going to admit to our shores. Now, any one of these arguably 
would create a lot of, of um, uh, conversation, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate. The fact that President Trump came along with this whole menu of isms caused lots and lots of voters to be attracted perhaps to one or two or three of them and again made it very difficult to discern which voters in which areas of which states were going to turn out in lower numbers or in higher numbers than has been the norm in, in the past. So if in fact on January the 20th, uh, President Trump leaves office and Joe Biden becomes the 46th president of the United States, we're going to see how far the mantle of Trumpism can be carried forward, um, who is going to be the standard bearer, and of course, whether or not former President Trump is going to stay on the national scene and maybe gear up for another run in, in 2024. He clearly has a large constituency loyal to him. Um, he's clearly demonstrated within the Republican Party an iron grip, or at least a lot of power, certainly within Republican voters and Republican primary voters. Um, I suspect that in a different environment, after the projection was made on Saturday to um, call the election for Joe Biden, more Republicans might have come out and called on the president to gracefully concede to Joe Biden. Thus far, only Mitt Romney from the United States Senate has, has been as bold. Um, Pat Toomey, a senator from Pennsylvania who's retiring, had said some of this stuff. But we know, of course, that other senators like Lindsey Graham and, and Ted Cruz in particular have been out front buttressing allegations of individual improprieties, the lack of poll watchers, um, irregularities in vote counting, instances of dead people voting or apparently dead people voting, but not having produced yet any evidence of a systematic um, type of organized fraud that might bring court intervention. Still, even beyond the horizon at this point, but any senator knows that if they come out and call for the president to concede before President Trump wants them to, he could probably defeat them when they're next up for election um, in, in, their, in their home states. Really a tremendous amount of, of power um, that the president has, has demonstrated. <laughs> now, the various media, the AP, CBS, Fox, CNN, all using, again, not intuition, but some type of statistical models projected Joe Biden to be the winner. Um, he and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, the first female American Vice President, the first um, uh, American vice president to have family from South Asia. Um, her father was born in Trinidad and the Caribbean. Her husband will be the first male spouse of either a president or a vice president. I guess they'll call him the, the second gentleman um, because Doug Emhoff is also Jewish. He will be the um, first um, American Jew to either be part of the first family or the second family in the United States. A, a lot of records set in, in the person of just one person, Kamala Harris, the California senator, now vice president-elect. Um, they gave a speech, we're going to unite the country. And in any 
normal, or at least using American uh, electoral history as, as a basis, um, when these calls were made, and the days transpired, and Georgia looks to be perhaps going blue, um, maybe even Arizona, um, the president might have, probably would have, would have seriously considered um, conceding so that the transition process, the very smooth handling, handing off control of the ship of state to, from the current president to the president that is going to succeed him would have already begun. And by all evidence, um, the government accounting office, the GAO responsible for providing the funding and the space for transition offices as of today has been unwilling to recognize that Joe Biden is in fact the, the president um, elect. But again, in many ways, some factual and historical, some not, um, this has not been a, a normal, traditional um, American election. President Trump has been defeated. Um, uh, a, a somewhat rare phenomenon in presidential politics, an incumbent who won a first term losing a bid for um, a second term. Um, President Trump joins a, a list of presidents um, that again have been defeated in, in winning a second term following the first term that they won. In 1800, um, our second president, John Adams, became a one-termer when he was defeated by Thomas um, Jefferson. 28 years later, our sixth president, John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, became a one-termer when he was defeated by Andrew Jackson. In the election of 1840, a New Yorker, Martin Van Buren, our eighth president, became a one-termer when he was defeated by William Henry Harrison, a.k.a. Tippecanoe, with, of course, John Tyler as his vice president. In 1858, our 14th president from the Granite State, New Hampshire, Franklin Pierce, um, was defeated in the election of 1856 by James Buchanan, thus relegating again Franklin Pierce to a one-term president. Now, this gets tricky here. Um, in 1888, um, 1884, Grover Cleveland, a New Yorker, was elected president of the United States. Four years later, in 1888, Grover Cleveland was defeated by Benjamin Harrison, Tippecanoe, William Henry Harrison's grandson, even though Grover Cleveland had won the national popular vote, he lost the electoral vote. But four years after that, all you Trump supporters, follow me here, in 1892, Grover Cleveland returned, challenged the incumbent, Benjamin Harrison, and defeated him to once again regain the presidency. Grover Cleveland considered both our 22nd and our 24th president, um, having again served the only American president in history thus far, two non-consecutive terms, and for whatever it's worth, Grover Cleveland is the only presidential candidate, um, um, aside from Franklin Roosevelt, to win the national popular vote three times in both of his defeats and in his loss um, in between. Um, in 1912, our 27th president, William Howard Taft, became a one-termer when he was defeated by Woodrow Wilson. Um, the election of 1932 saw one-term president Herbert Hoover um, defeated in his bid for re-election by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1980. Jimmy Carter, 
who had won the election of 1976, was elected in 1980 by Ronald Reagan. <clears throat> in 1992, George H.W. Bush, George Bush the Elder, a one-term president defeated by Bill Clinton. 28 years later, in, in 2020, as, as things stand now, President Trump might, might um, join that club of, of one-term presidents. Keep in mind, he is fully and totally constitutionally eligible if he were to be defeated now to seek another term as president in 2024. Keep that in mind. Um, now, as President Trump has, has been, again, speaking about since April, this large number of mail-in ballots that, that were cast, more than 40% of the nation voted by mail, were the means by which he suggested elections can be rigged, elections could be stolen, um, um, uh, graft and corruption could be engaged in. It's almost like, and he's trying to say, he had a crystal ball projecting this um, six months ago. Um, thus, a range of allegations have been made by the president, by surrogates like um, Rudy Giuliani, with both of his hands in, in full view, by the way. Um, allegations that Sharpie markers used in Arizona didn't permit ballots to be counted. That case was dropped. The lack of not poll watchers, but enough poll watchers being close enough to actually see what was taking place in vote counts in, in Philadelphia. Some allegations of wholesale manufacturing of ballots in favor of Vice President Biden. And I suspect there are going to be a number of examples where people who were dead or have been dead or died before the election, somehow managed to, to cast a vote. The numbers again, perhaps in, in the dozens. And again, in order to overturn the apparent results of these elections, you would have to suggest multi-state shenanigans had, had taken place. Um, none of these have, have yet produced any evidence, meaning that it would be impossible at this point to get any court to, to consider um, on these claims. Now, depending on how these last few states turn out, the margin of victory for um, former Vice President Biden can, can vary. If Arizona and, and Georgia, per, for instance, end up going for President Trump, he would get their electoral votes, and Biden's margin of victory would be 279 to 259. If Arizona were going to go for, um, if, if rather, if um, Georgia were to go for Vice President Biden, he's leading there by 16 electoral votes, um, 10,000 votes, the margin would be 295 to 243. 25 over the 270. If Arizona went for Biden, but not Georgia, the result would be 290 for Biden, 248 for um, President Trump. And if Biden ends up winning Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Arizona, the total electoral vote count would read 306 for Biden, 232 for President Trump. The same exact electoral count, electoral vote count four years ago when President Trump defeated Hillary Clinton. A result that at times President Trump referred to as one of the greatest electoral college landslides in history, a great victory, the numbers might be flipped exactly against him. So depending on how these states turn out, tells us 
how many different states have to somehow have proven irregularities presented to an extent not to give President Trump any more votes. This type of legislation will not add any votes from the Biden column to the Trump column. However, if there is some systematic organized fraud that is proven in any particular state, in theory, Biden's numbers may decrease by 44,000, 10,000, who knows? That is the very high bar that the presidents and his um, attorneys would, would have to meet. And of course, a lot of the allegations are centered around the vote tabulations in big cities like Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee, and Atlanta, places that are overwhelmingly Democratic voting and very diverse um, blue, blue states. Um, there's a possibility that President Trump may not concede. Nothing says he has to. He's thrown convention and habit out the window in, in lots of other cases. But barring any overturning of the vote in any of these states, the Constitution says his term ends on January the 20th of 2021 when the new president who won the electoral vote will be inaugurated. So he may just go um, quietly and never formally um, concede to, to Joe Biden. And one of the reasons, of course, is that just about everyone who's held the office of president, any serious candidate who has sought the presidency, has run for political office before. And they're familiar, in most cases, having lost races, how to go through the concession process. You call the person who defeated you and congratulate him. You go onto a stage and say, I just talked to President so-and-so and gave him my congratulations on his victory. And then you go on to, to the next race. Um, not only, of course, has President Trump not sought elective office, you know, we've seen, of course, this almost mythologized legend of Donald Trump in, in previous um, walks of life as someone who is a winner, winning being very much um, a part of his brand. Not only does he never lose, he doesn't concede. So in the last few days, we've heard reports, for whatever they're worth, of members of the president's family, maybe his wife, um, maybe um, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, maybe his daughter, um, Ivanka, um, trying to find ways so that the president could concede without having to admit he lost. That again would be a talk about threading a needle. That might be the type of, of rhetorical gymnastics needed for, for this to, to occur. Now, again, Article 2 of the Constitution gives to every state the right to determine how their electors are chosen. We know that when we go vote for president, even though the ballot says the name of the nominee of the party, in reality, we are voting, like in the case of Florida, with the 20, for the 29 electors committed either to Joe Biden or to President Trump, the 38 electors committed to the Democratic nominee, Biden, or the Republican nominee, Trump, um, the 18 electors committed to Biden or Trump in Ohio, the three in Montana, and so on. 
whoever wins the most votes in a state gets to have their 29, 38, three electors appear at the state capitol of that state on the Monday following the second Wednesday in December when the electoral college meets in order to have the electoral votes won on November the 3rd cast for the candidate who won the state. Right now, Pennsylvania and Georgia and Michigan and Wisconsin and Arizona award their electoral votes to the candidate who wins the statewide popular vote. There's been some suggestions that the Pennsylvania legislature could enact a law where it gets to appoint a slate of pro-Trump electors. Or the Republican-controlled Michigan or Wisconsin legislature, notwithstanding the fact that these states each have Democratic governors who could veto legislation, submit a slate of electors of their own, Supreme Court rulings suggest that a state legislature cannot alter the way in which electors are awarded in the midst of a presidential election process. Imagine if this occurred in every state where the legislature was controlled by the party other than the apparent president-elect. So a lot of suggestions, a lot of pundits out there saying, well, Pennsylvania's legislature could just vote to select a roster of electors of their own. That almost certainly is not constitutionally um, permissible. <clears throat> now again, if evidence is produced showing with, with some probity that there has been serious, significant, um, substantial, organized fraud, state courts, maybe eventually federal courts, might consider these claims if proven and if the votes in question can be identified and segregated out maybe, maybe um, they could be deducted from one column. But at this point, there is not one scintilla of evidence suggesting that the type of multi-state, substantial, enormous, organized fraud that we've heard about and have had seen tweets about has occurred. You know, think about it. How would these states go to all this trouble to tinker with ballots, but still permit in the down ballot races, Republicans to do extraordinarily well in House races. They've narrowed the majority that Democrats have in the House. And how in the world would Republicans retain control of the Senate? which unless these two Georgia races, we'll talk about this next month on January the 5th, these runoffs go for Democrats against all the odds, Republicans are going to remain in control of the Senate and Democrats did not gain control of a single state house, which many pundits believed they were going to do all over the place, maybe even in Texas and in Florida and in Pennsylvania. So the idea that all of this organized fraud occurred where only one race, the presidential race, was tampered with and all of these other overperformances by Republicans were, were permitted to um, continue, again, um, defies logic, I, I, I suppose. But again, um, a lot of talk, uh, a lot of internet traffic, um, a lot of conspiracies um, being um, 
cooked up. So we will see how, how that occurs. Now, when we meet again to bring our Road to the White House series um, to an end this year, and to introduce the topics that we are going to begin um, to consider in January of 2021, there's news of, a, of an effective vaccine for COVID um, that hopefully is going to be released soon. Maybe there is a light at the end of the tunnel regarding the resumption of our live gatherings. I sure hope so. And, and I thank everyone for persevering um, through, these, through these proceedings. It's very hard to sit here and, and lecture to an audience of my wife or, or my children. Um, you know, um, my, my um, Daughter's phone starts ringing during the course of filming a lecture. You know, that's a no-no. Thought I caught my wife nodding off a couple of times during the filming of these lectures. That is a real big no-no. So, so I thank all of you for, for persevering. When we meet next month, we will go over the extensive exit polling that has been conducted um, in a lecture entitled, What Now? we will look hopefully with more certainty regarding the winner of the race, probably going to be um, Joe Biden, um, and how he won, what demographic groups turned out, maybe in larger numbers, maybe shifted a bit to, to bring him that margin of victory. And we'll talk about how formally the race ends with the meeting of the electors on December 14th, uh, the joint session of Congress on January the 6th to approve the electoral vote, and then finally on January the 20th with an inauguration of a new president. I've got to go back and watch cable TV because I might have missed something. I think this is the longest I've been away while awake um, from watching some type of a vote counting show. So I've got to get back, maybe some of you do too, but it's certainly um, very nice seeing and speaking to all of you, and hopefully we will see each other soon. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone, and we'll see you again in December. Take care.